So, uh, because uh, we are behind in the thing, and we're going to catch up actually, I think this week is the last week that we're going to have the lab this way, lecturing, we'll see. So, if we, continue, if we are on time and I have extra time, then half of the lab is going to be for problem solving. Uh, it's not going to be lectured like this, so um, I think we are catching up. Um, so, um, the quiz, until then, that we, we have time in lab, the quiz will be all online and asynchronous. It is open today till midnight, so you have time to, to do it. Okay, those with accommodation, it's already included in the thing, in the, um, uh, it's already set, it's set automatically, so you can actually, when you submit, it's going to add the time to yours. Uh, and also, um, if, the, if when you are submitting through the submitter with matrix, and it doesn't say accommodated, let me know, and I'll uh, fix that one too. I think I added everyone that needed it, but if it's not there, then uh, uh, please. Uh. So we, before we, uh, uh, before we uh, start, any questions about the topics we had before? Let me, actually the best is to actually open up what we talked about last time. I'm just gonna go through it and ask if you have any questions about it. So this is what we have done last time. Uh, it is, right? Oh, this, what is the section? This is B, right? So yeah. So this is what we have done last time. We talked a little bit about reading the thing, which uh, parts of it Actually, uh, somebody contacted me and we went through Scaneth and we found out that this and this will not work, okay? So essentially for to skip the tab and see if it's tab or not and skip backslash n over here when you are doing f scanf, uh, you gotta have a separate reading of a single character and compare it. So, um, and I asked the gentleman to, um, uh, share the findings with everyone else. I think this is mixed. Let me just do it one more time. Yeah. Okay, then we talked about dynamic memory allocation and then explained how dynamic memory allocation works. We went through the slides and we saw when we are doing dynamic memory allocation, uh, it, it is, uh, you do dynamic memory allocation when, uh, there are two reasons for it, main reasons. Number one is that you uh, do not have uh, uh, d enough data to know how much information you need. You need the program r to run and find that information from somewhere, either from the file or from the, from the user to, under to, to know how much data is needed, then create the array or whatever is needed because of that, we, uh, we need dynamic memory allocation. Number two, just a second, uh, was that uh, the, 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 the amount of information was so big that would bloat our executable because when you do it at compile time, it engraves that piece of memory inside your executable and we don't want that. Because of that fact, we, we let the memory uh, allocation happen at runtime, yes. Yeah, for, as a challenge, you put it on GitHub, you put, uh, and you, you were saying one more time? Oh, I don't even remember what the question was, quite frankly. <laughs> so I have to, I have to see, what was the question? Anyone remember what the challenge was? What was it? Oh, no, 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 that was a different thing. I said that. That was for, we were doing data entry. So what we said over here, we are, for example, in here we are getting a new integer. We are asking how many, and then we are getting the integer. But what can we do not to ask the user? Sometimes users don't know how many, they have a bunch of things on a paper, they just know it's many. So I ask you if you could remove the, uh, 
the request from the user for the number to be allocated and do it on the fly, which means start with an initial value, and then if it exceeds that, then you resize it and make it bigger as you're going. That was the challenge. And if you have done that challenge, put it on GitHub, contact me on, uh, 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 on Microsoft Teams, and we'll go through it. I just found out that our, my Microsoft team now has a, a phone number. So it has a 416 number, actually. So, and I put it in a signature of my email, and I'm going to add it to the office thingy on Blackboard. So what happens is that uh, if you call that number, my team's gets the ring and you can call me on Teams and talk to me, okay? Obviously, if I'm busy, it's gonna tell you call later. Yes? So by in the instructor part one, the same thing that uh, I was telling, there are two different uh, uh, functions, like one with the brackets. Where and what with the? Yeah. So how you allocate, that's how you deallocate. If, oh, I'll explain it, so that's what question number one, remember that. I'm gonna bring Visual Studio and explain it over there. So the question is that when do we put square bracket and when we don't? I'll explain that one, thank you, okay. So the next thing we did over here, uh, there we go, so. Oh, we created uh, uh, a structure and we read that structure dynamically with uh, uh, in an array to show you how you actually uh, can dynamically allocate a record where inside that record you have dynamic memory allocation. So that we went through, uh, that is kind of exactly like what you have to do in the workshop. So uh, that's that. Uh, so we explained that uh, when you have a record that has dynamic memory allocation it's inside, uh, the, the stage of allocation must happen in two stages. Stage number one, to create an array of the records dynamically. Stage number two, individual array, individual elements of the record should have its own dynamic memory allocation. And then when you are deallocating, it has to happen the exact reverse, which means first you have to remove the individual dynamic memory allocation inside the records elements of the array, which are essentially the records, then delete the whole array. So that was that one, and we used the utils uh, that we, that I added to your, uh, uh, or we didn't use that one, so we, we just created the utils and added for flush key and read dynamic string thingy that we had that I explained. Um, we can have a local variable of a big size, of big size in reading a string, and then we can get it from the user up to the certain amount that we want. And then after that, we can actually measure how big is the string and allocate uh, memory for it, and then copy the memory we received in a big chunk into the adjusted size of memory. And because the function is over, the automatic variable will be uh, removed automatically. And what is returned dynamically to user holds exactly the size of data that user enters, and that was dynamically allocated memory. So that was that. Having said that, I'm gonna go with the first question that, that we had over here, so um, let me just close this and go back to <coughs> and I'm gonna open my cheat sheet so I can go through today's lecture more easily. So today is gonna be functions and privacy. That's uh, methods, sorry, member functions and privacy, which essentially translates to methods and privacy. We'll go through it, and we're gonna have a, if we have time, we're gonna have a slight uh, a kind of a preview of what we're gonna have next uh, day that you're coming in. So we'll, we'll find the need for, for them. We're gonna have a touch of constructors and destructors and see what they are. But uh, let me just, uh, before we continue, let me open up. <clears throat> okay, uh, so answering to the question of when do we use, when do we use no uh, uh, brackets when we are deleting and when we use brackets when we are deleting. Perfect answer for it is something like this. Let's say I have uh, a structure over here, and that structure of mine holds uh, uh, 
holds uh, uh, information about a student. Easiest thing is that. And that student has character name, uh, 51. It has uh, integer uh, number of semester. It has integer uh, or double uh, GPA. Okay, and obviously I made the mistake of not following my own rules, so M like that, M like this. So, GPA, and uh, let's say over here I have a struct subject, and the subject has character subject code. of uh, OOP244NAA, that's nine, so 10. Uh, 10 characters over there, subject, and uh, over here we have integer mark. And let's say I have a series of subjects over here, so I'll go subject. So this student took these subjects down to this point. Let's say we're gonna call it M uh, taken, which means these subjects are taken and the maximum number of subjects a student can take is how many, I don't know. No, 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 the, the whole thing, this is your transcript. So, uh, so well, how many, six semesters? Let's say each one, each one five. Let's say 30, we gotta make it 40, okay? So 40 subjects you can take, and obviously in here I, I have to have an integer M number of subjects taken, right? So these are the things that we have. I wrote this just to show you that this is a big chunk of stuff. If I want to just create one student, what I'll do is to create a student pointer S and set it to new student. So I create one student and do whatever I want to do with it. So I work with it and I'm done. So this is whatever happens over here. It doesn't matter. At the end, to delete, I delete the way I allocated. Do you see any square brackets here? No, so when you delete, you say delete S. So one entity, one delete. I know that entity is ginormous. It has 40 subjects and each subject has 10. And maybe we have over here even character M subject name that is 256, some huge. So, so, so this student over here is a ginormous thing. And because of that, I want to allocate it dynamically not to have a big things, a big thing set, and I want it to be in the heap. That's why I do it. But if I have 40 students in a class and I want to have something like that, so in here I'm gonna say <coughs> student uh, pointer as students is new, let's say, student, and I have 400 students that I am taking care of. Now, if I have something like that, to delete that, I have to delete exactly how I create. I have square bracket, that's how I delete it. So in here, I'm gonna say, delete square bracket students. Got it? Hopefully that answers the question. And we do not need to mention how many, as long as you tell, to the compiler that the, what I created was allocated as an array, this 400 is in the OS. Operating system knows that this address is pointing to an array of 400 students. So it will be deleted. So what happens is that the compiler says, OS delete an array pointed by STDS. In here it says OS delete an object pointed by S. Therefore in here one object is deleted and in here operating system okay it says oh this is an array let me see how many was it 400 I'm gonna delete them all. So you don't need to give that information to the OS. OS knows by itself because you already mentioned how many you want. Got it? Now the consequence of making a mistake if you actually delete it like this, you are telling OS delete an object pointed by SDDS, therefore 99 of them will not be deallocated. 
only the first one gets deallocated. So you're going to have lots of uh, memory leak in here. So the consequence of not deleting an array as an array causes the uh, memory leak. Yes? Oh, my apologies. Bad short-term memory. <laughs> I thought that. So it's the, and 399 of them will not be deallocated. Only the first one will be de deleted. Only the first one will be deleted. Yes? One more time. So, so you want to say I want to have an array of one, one element. Yeah. So, of course, what the thing is that what what our friend says over here, couldn't we just just the, say the heck with it and just do everything like an array instead of this? I'm gonna say over here, student one. So I can delete it as such. Is that what you're saying? No, 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 you can't. No, because now you're telling to OS there was an array. Delete it, and you, OS looks at it, it's only one. What array? Okay. If I told you there are 500 cars parked over there, go to the parking lot and get into the first one. Right? You go to the parking lot, you see 500 cars, you go to the first one. Right? But what would say, why do I care? I'm going to say, there are an array of park, park, cars parked over there. Go to the first one. You go over there, you see only one car. Don't you get confused? They told me there are several cars here, and it's only one. What do I do? Don't do that. OK, you are confusing the OS. OK, that is set to be, it just, yeah. yeah. All right, so, so we won't do that, and this is bad. I'm going to say common mistake that but like three, four people who actually contacted me with problem that they had, that was their problem. When they were deleting the contents of the, uh, the workshop that we had, you had to delete the contents inside, and they just deleted without square brackets, and that's what happened, okay? We, uh, I see lots of, uh, uh, I see lots of, lots of, uh, problem with pointers, so please review the pointers. Review the pointers, so that's better, because like that, all of you are going to fall asleep in, in like three, three seconds. I had to. You can see the screen properly, right? Any questions down here? Any question one? Any question two? All right. So that was the answer to the question. So. And again, as I mentioned, the quiz is open till midnight. Whenever you have time, do it. It's like 10 minutes that you have to go through it and do it quickly, so please do it. So in here, I'm going to say A, answer to DMA question. OK, so that's the first one. Don't tell me I'm not recording. I am recording. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right. But always check. No harm in that. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, wait a minute. By the way, the question was, what is the, the question for the DMA was, what is the difference between deleting with or without square brackets? Yes, you were saying. So, like, uh, is, is there a reason after you delete, you don't set the pointer back to null? Okay, setting the pointer back to null after deleting. Setting the pointer back to null after deleting, okay? For now, be obsessive about it, do it. I don't do it because I know when it's not needed, okay? For you, as a rookie, set it to null for now until the time comes, but don't, don't set it always to null and be happy with it. Whenever you are setting a pointer to null after deletion, remember that you are doing it because you're a rookie, because you're just new in this. 
As soon as you found out why, then don't do it all the time. Okay, make sure you know why. But for now, not to have problem, set it to null after deleting. So setting a pointer to null after deleting guarantees that if the pointer gets deleted again, nothing's gonna happen. Because delete null is just nothing. Nothing's gonna happen, no error, nothing. It's a safe thing to do, okay? That's why when, and again, following the same rule, at any moment that you are allocating memory inside a pointer, if you don't know where the pointer is coming from, it's, it is safe to delete it first. You follow? So when you are doing dynamic memory allocation, the pointer that you have, you don't know where it's coming from. It's a pointer that is coming from a function. It's not a pointer that you just created. You don't know what happened to this pointer before. If you are allocating something to it and you are setting it to, to a new piece of memory, it is a good practice to delete it before that, which means it, two things are gonna happen. Either somebody deleted it and didn't set it to null, so it's gonna crash, which is good. You know something, okay? So first of all, that enforces the null after deletion. Number two, if a po the pointer is already pointing to something, no memory leak is gonna happen. So it's a good idea to do so, okay? Are we good? All right. So that's kind of a review on DMA. So I think we're gonna have the, uh, the other, uh, yeah, anyways. So. So let's say I want to create, so because, uh, yeah. Let's say I, I want to create, a, um, uh, which reminds me actually, I want to create a, uh, a class that represents a container, any type of container. Now this is a container that holds coffee. This one is a container that holds water. And what are the specifications of these containers? Like if you're saying container, like this container could be a barrel. Okay, first of all, they're supposed to hold liquid, so it's a good idea to have <coughs> the, um, the uh, what do you call it, volume? It means the, the, the size that it has and thing that it can, so the volume, it has a maximum number, volume. So we need to have that. We need to know what's inside, and I need to know how much it has cur currently, right? So these are the basic things I need to know about a container. So we want to create a class that simulates a container. So. Sidewise, I don't want it to fall. Okay, back in business. All right, I'm gonna pause. Boom. All right, so let's create the container over here. Let's create the container, and the container we are creating, what are we doing with it? So I'm gonna say, uh, we're gonna create a class called container. When I say struct, I mean? Class, class. okay. And you'll see soon that we can actually write over here class, but soon, not yet. So that's struct. And but by the way, potatoes, potatoes, good, uh, good uh, interview answer. So one of the things that they do, what is the difference between a struct and a class in uh, C++? The answer is nothing. We'll find out later on what it has just minor difference, but they are identical things, okay? All right, so container, so I need to know what is the amount inside the container, right? To have uh, so much uh, value in it. Uh, what is the volume? Should we make those double? Because we are saying liters, right? Yeah, I think double makes more sense. So the other class I did it, integer, um, I see it was a mistake. <coughs> oh, that's a new version of double. Double, okay. Double, okay. And then we have character m content that say a 256. Actually, the best way to actually calculate what you want to do, uh, like uh, just a suggestion to, to get the record sizes that you are putting over there, um, is to uh, have it uh, to be coefficient of 2 to power n, okay? So when you're, 
uh, so double is eight, right? So eight by eight, 16. So if I want to do it, 256 minus 18, uh, minus 16, it's gonna be 240, right? So if I make this one 240, then the sum of the whole thing will be 256. And 256 is two to power, right? So um, the chunks that are uh, your memory inside the computer is segmented into pieces of two to power n, either 1024 or 246. So if you write anything, if you create a file or a small thing inside your computer and it's only three bytes, it will occupy uh, a segment that is 496 bytes. So it's always good to have uh, the records you are creating coefficient to be coefficient of two to power something to use least amount of memory. You can simply ignore what I just said. It's a three, four, five thing, but it's good to hear it. So one day you may go, ah, oh. okay, so that's that. So I'm gonna make this 240, 240, and that makes it 256, hopefully. So now if I want to actually use this container, I'm gonna say um, void display. And I wanna display a container, so I'm gonna have over here, I wanna display the container, so I'll go container. First of all, I'll pass the reference. You always pass uh, objects by reference unless you don't want, you, you have a reason not to, okay? Because passing it by value means display has to create a container that is 256 bytes and copy everything. Like this, this only becomes a new name for a, a container that is out there. So <clears throat> that's my container. And um, I just wanna make sure because it's display, it doesn't change it. So I'm gonna make sure I'm not gonna shoot myself in the foot. So I'll make it constant. Therefore, container is displayed like that. And uh, we'll display the container like this. So I'm gonna say, uh, I'm gonna say uh, C out, uh, M amount, uh, C dot M amount, Um, C at uh, liters of of M content uh, C dot M content oh, content in container of M C dot M volume C dot M volume liters. Okay. Do I go to new line? No, because it's just displaying the container. If I want to go to new line, I'm gonna do it outside. Remember, a function should only do what it's supposed to. Okay? then the job of this thing is to display it. It's not display and go to new line, okay? If, so if somebody wants to print this and put something in front or at back, they can do it. So give, have that option open all, at all times. Are we okay with this? All right, so if I have a container like this, so if I have uh, a container uh, I'm going to call it over here CNT, and I'm going to initialize it to uh, say uh, 25.5 in a uh, thing of, uh, let's say, uh, 100 liters, and it's going to be water. Okay? So I'm going to do this. That's universal way of initializing CNT. So you essentially put it with the exact same order, and automatically it's going to initialize it. So now I can check the display by saying display CNT and see if it works. Release often, release early, which means try to uh, always do whatever you are doing uh, right at the beginning. So 2.25.5 liters of water in a cont container of 100 liters. Are we good with this? We're okay? Are we okay one? Are we okay two? All right, 
Now, the next thing I want to do over here is to actually be able to get this from the user. I want to ask the user to enter the container information for me. And to do that, I have to create a read function, correct? Read function receives, obviously, with no doubt, a reference of a container because I'm supposed to read. And obviously, it's not con constant because I want this alias of incoming uh, function to actually uh, overwrite the values that I have. First, let me just uh, remove this for a second and I'll save this as a.nonoo container display.cpp so you know what the first stage is. And we're going to go to stage two. And I'm going to add read. So for reading this, obviously, I'm going to say see out contain, uh, content. Content. You can have a label over there saying like mm, container entry or whatever, OK? And then I'm going to get the value C in into C dot M content, OK? Now, uh, C in M content, I have to make sure that this does not have in any space. So this, well, this version of it cannot accept any space. If I say orange space juice, orange is going to go into it because CN's delimiter is space. Okay? And then I'm going to go C out. Uh, the next one I'm going to say is uh, uh, container volume. Or I'm going to say volume. So in here I'm going to say C out container entry and go to new line, container entry, and go to new line, and then I'm doing vo volume, I'm going to go C in, into C dot volume, and get the volume, and I go C out uh, amount. Why, amount is not a good thing. What do I say to that thing? Anybody can tell me? What do I put instead of amount? The amount of thing that we have inside the container. Content amount? Ah, forget. Amount. <clears throat> so amount and then C in C dot M amount. So now instead of actually initializing, I can have a container just like that. I'm going to make it empty. Like that, everything's going to be zero in it when you initialize it. That's the universal way of setting everything to zero. Now I'm going to say uh, re read uh, CNT and then I'm going to display it. Right? So when I run this program, it's going to go through them one by one, and it's going to say container entry, content. Over here, I'm going to say milk. And I'm going to say volume is 220 liters. One of those big barriers of milk. They're going to, I don't know, do something with it. And then the amount that is in it is only 200.2 liters. So it's going to say 200.2 liters of milk in a container of 220 liters. Are we okay with this? Questions? This is kind of a marriage of C and C++. So I'm using C++ commands, but this is all C. Because that, that scary thing of an action receiving a, a container is happening. Remember that hello thingy at night that I said you're going to get, if somebody tells you wake up at night, you're going to get scared? That's what's happening. Read over here doesn't have an owner. Read doesn't belong to anyone. That read could be any read. I don't like it. Yes. Huh? Doesn't have any owner. You just spoke. Ask a question, right? So a human being posed the question. Where did that question come from? You. Everybody knows it's you. Now, if everybody's quiet and somebody said over there, "What the two is coming from?" Everybody's gonna run out the door, right? If suddenly uh, a question comes out of thin air with no owner attached to it. That's scary in an object-oriented world. We live in an object-oriented world. That's why we have object-oriented programming languages, so we can think like real world. Okay? And that's what we want to do. So this essentially is a non-object-oriented... Why am I having so many A's? This one's going to be B. And this one's going to be C. And that's a non-object-oriented container with read and write. 
Okay? But that's not right. I'm not supposed to do something like that. Okay? What we need to do over here is to actually make the container own what it's saying. When you remember, it's a block scope which means the CNT comes to life at line 21, that is the beginning of the scope main, and dies at line 25, which is the end of the scope of main. Are we okay with this? All right? And yeah, so that's that. Now, what I can do over here is to apply the encapsulation we have in uh, C++, which means instead of having read out there with nobody owning it, I can bring those two functions right inside container. So what I can do, I can actually write the prototype of the read in here and write the pr put the uh, uh, display over there and the prototype of, of read over here. Okay? But if read and display are in the same scope of these, because this is the beginning of the block, right? This is the end of the block. So amount, volume, content are within this block. Therefore, those values are visible to display and read, correct? I do not need to pass anything to them because display knows who's displaying, read knows who's, what is reading. Read is reading information to its own content Display is displaying the content of amount. Therefore, in here, I have to mention this display actually belongs to the class container, exactly like a namespace, but this one is actually a class, container read, and I do not need to pass anything to them. Moreover, I do not need to have any structure thingy beside it. I simply say amount, content, and volume. Because display is inside container, it has access to all those values. And because read is inside container, it has access to all those values. Therefore, read passing a CNT to it will change to CNT, read your content. Display, display your content and you don't need to pass anything to them. So CNT reads, display reads, now we have something to work on. Are we okay with this? Never ask that question, always come in. You're always welcome to come in. Are we good? All right, so now what happens over here is this, take a look. So first of all, if I run this, you know what's gonna happen. The execution is identical to the other one. It's just behind the scene that changes, right? So in here, I'm going to say content, milk, and volume, 200, amount, 100. That's the, the thing that I have. And what else I need to tell you is that when I speak, no one else does. Please do not speak in my class. Thank you. All right. So, so that's uh, the OO version of it. So I'm going to say... Uh, kind of, so encapsulated. I'm not going to say O oh, because it's not object-oriented yet. I just applied encapsulation. I need many things to be applied to make this an object. So this is encapsulated, encapsulated container. Container getting close to OO.cpp. Woo, that's the name. All right. Now, just to show you what happens next over here, what I can do over here is actually create a container. Let's say three containers now. So I have three containers, and I can simply write a loop, uh, and I can say over here for, let's have an integer i over here, for i set to zero, i less than three, and i plus plus. In here, I can say cnti.read, so each CNT will call read of its own and set the property of that particular CNT and no one else's. And then it's exact same thing. I can actually do it like that and I can say display. So in here I can actually show C out. 
i plus 1 and go like that, put a column over here. And after I display that, I can say uh, C out and L. So, and I'm going to display every and each. So now if I run this program, I have three CNTs. Each one will call the read, putting the value in their own owner's properties. Therefore, uh, it's going to kind of make, make sense. So uh, I, I should have actually mentioned something over here. What, 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 what? So in here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it better. I'm going to say over here, uh, C out, I plus 1, I plus 1. OK. So now, I'm going to say that one, and I'm going to put over here like that. And I'm going to say 3 out of 3. And I'm going to put it like that. So we can actually see what we are entering. You will run it one more time. So now it's going to say one out of three. OK, container entry. And I'm going to have a container. So first one's going to be milk, uh, 220, volume 100. Number two, now in here I'm going to say water. Uh, I'm going to say, um, uh, what do I do? Uh, uh, again, 220. And this one's going to be 200. And the other one's going to be oil. And I'm going to have 100, and it's going to be 50. So I'm going to have the three containers. Each one has its own value separated, separately set inside the uh, objects that we have. Are we good? Are we OK? All right. Now, no, no, no. See, that's D. What am I doing? D. So this one's going to be E. All right. All right. Now, take a look. In here, I can actually come, and for some unknown reason, I can say CNTI, and I'm going to say, oh, I don't know, volume. Right? So when I run this program, actually, let me go to the other one that we don't have too many things. Uh, let me bring the other one. I don't want to run 50,000 things over here. Let me just have the one with one, and I'm going to bring that one in here. OK? So in here, I can read the CNT, and I can say CNT dot, say, amount, do like that. Right? And when I run the program, what happens over here? So it reads, so content is milk, to, uh, 220, and the amount is 100. But when I print it, it's going to show you some awkward number over there. What the heck just happened? The thing was this. Imagine that we are standing in lineup, Tim Hortons, and the gentleman over here is right behind me, and we want to get our coffee. I get over there, and I think, oh my god, I didn't bring my wallet. May I have your name? Liam. Liam. Oh, Liam. We talked. Yeah. So, Liam. So, yeah. So, Liam is sitting, uh, standing behind me, and I've got, Liam, I forgot my wallet. Can I have a couple of bucks, please, if you don't mind? And I'm going to give it back to you. I'm his prop. He's guaranteed he's going to get the $2 back, so hopefully. So, he's going to give me the $2. Probably he will, right? Yeah, absolutely, right? He will do it, yeah. Fine. That everything's OK. So it's absolutely 100% sure that I'm going to get the $2. But just imagine, I'm at Tim Hortons, and I'm doing like this, and I don't see anything. I don't have it. And I put my hand in his pocket, and I pick the $2 out. It works, right? I got my $2. And I'm a very good person. Tomorrow, when he's not looking, I'm going to put the $2 back in his pocket. It works, right? What would happen, really? He's going to slap me in the face, punch in the stomach. What the heck are you doing, man? Get out of here. Like, you know, don't touch me, right? What went wrong here? This is what went wrong. Line number 25. Nobody's allowed to touch any properties of container but container itself. Don't come to me and say, but it works. Remember the Tim Hortons example. It shouldn't. You should not be able to touch 
anyone's property without their consent or request. Can I borrow your cell phone to make an emergency call? Fine, but if I pick her phone over, he says, what, what the devil is going on? He's speaking to so you, you follow what I'm saying? So how do we enforce that with this? I'm going to say, hey, all the things I have over here are private, and these are the public things you can access. So what happens now, the compiler won't let you do this. Member container, yada, 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 is inaccessible. I cannot change the value unless I do it through read or display. Are we okay with this? Hence, member functions and privacy. Are we good with this? All right. So now we know that objects can actually hold the thing. Now, let me just, I did not mention this in the other class. I hope I remember to do it next time. So what's the difference between a struct and a class? Okay? Struct is public by default. Struct is made so you can create a record and access it with no permission, just a record. Class is made to be private by default. So either I have to do this or I have, I could do this. Obviously, me as a person who always liked descriptive code, a code that describes what it's, what's in it without mentioning, I wouldn't mind to put the private over there anyway. But if you remove it, that's still private. So still you will get an error message because classes are private by default. All right? So remember that. So in here, I'm going to say optional. Private, optional, since, whoa, since classes are private by default, but good to have. It's good to have it. It's not going to, let me just do it like this. It's not going to hurt. It's just going to put an emphasis, hey, these are private. I know you know it's private, but I'm just letting you know. It's like, you know, like, yeah, anyways. So what do I have here? Questions down to this point? Now, in the other one that we had, the one that we had before, we protected the, dis uh, the display from ourselves to make sure that we are not going to do something like this over here. We're not going to say C dot amount is equal to 20, 30, 24. So that constraint, why is it? Oh, it's not giving me an error because uh, it is, uh, what should we call it? Uh, it is not, uh, uh, it's not being compiled. But this would give you an error. It won't allow you to do it because this is constant. You cannot change the value in here. So it, it's, it's not privacy, but it enforces uh, logic. <clears throat> Essentially, it protects you from you. So if you, in your, because you're saying the display's job is display, I do not want the container to change. How do we do that? How do we do that in a function, in a member function? By the way, these are called methods. These are called attributes. Methods, attributes. Member functions, member variables. Methods, attributes. When I say method, what do I mean? Member function. When I say attribute, what do I mean? Member variable. Perfect. To make these functions read only from the thing so I cannot change something, you add a const over here. So you are saying, hey, and you have to put it in a definition over here too. So you are saying, hey, this const is supposed to only read. You can look, no touch. Okay? You can take a look and see what's the information. You cannot touch the values. Are we good? Are we OK one? Are we OK two? OK, so, so. <sighs> yeah, so, and this is going to be an error, obviously. Since m amount is private. OK? We run it. Again, this is one of the things that, uh, again, lots of people come, come and tell me, but it works. If you don't put any of these constraints, you still get the, the, the thing program running. But the problem is that when you use my program to actually code and do 
application development, you're not going to have a bug. When you use your code that doesn't have these constraints, you may have a bug in there that is going to be very difficult to catch. Okay? All these cons constraints are for our, our good. For example, if I want, like for example in here, let me just save this. So in here I'm going to say, so I'm going to say methods and privacy. Okay, so, and uh, let me bring this one up. And I've got to bring the loop thingy back on. Come, 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 where's the loop? Loop, 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 loop. It's this one, I think. Yeah, so when I look at this one, I'm going to copy this and bring it in here. So still, my container is a class, and it has privacy and all the good stuff that I have, right? Everything looks good, right? Now, this right thingy is first showing the row, and then it goes to new line, right? So I would like to write a, a function that does that, not to put these things. Whenever I have so many things doing something with a purpose, I like to do that. So in here, I'm going to say void. Uh, container row. It has an integer row number, integer row, and it has a constant, because I want to display it, container reference C, and what else does it have? And that's it. So it's a row, it's going to go to new line, right? So what I will do in this function is this, I'm going to put it like this, and take these things over here, put it in here, and I'm going to just put the row, and display the row, and this is going to be C. Any problem with this that I've written? I just, I've, I just put, put those things in a package, right? And in here, I'm going to say container row. I'm going to put I plus 1, which is the row number that is being passed, and CNT I so it's going to actually display it. Line by line, I'm not going to go through it. You know it's going to work, right? But I'll show you why that const over there is important. Now let me remove the const and see what happens. So display doesn't have a const, right? But take a look at here. In the container row, because I'm a good programmer, I say I want to display the container. It has to be constant, correct? When you look at it, it's going to say, you're not allowed to call display because display is not a constant method. It may change the object. So you cannot call that method. So if you do not follow the logic obsessively and set the functions who do not change the owner to constant, the functions may not be used properly by other programmers. They can't use it anymore. Because I'm a good programmer, I know when I want to show a container row, I'm not going to change anything in a container, I'm just displaying it. And therefore, it's not going to work. And I'm going to, then in here, I'm going to open an issue on GitHub and say, fix this thing in your code. Your container display is, is changing the object, it's not supposed to. So now I put the const back in. And in here, I'm going to say, <coughs> OK, since OK for container reference to be const since display is const. Are we OK with this? Are we OK one? Are we OK two? We good? All right. <coughs> so this one is going to be uh, G uh, const methods to enforce logic dot CPP to enforce read only logic. Any problem down to this point? We're okay. All right, uh, I didn't compile it. Does it does it run? Yeah, 
Okay, just comp uh, let me just let me just do it. I, I don't want later on you tell me. Uh, Okay, it works. All right. 11.57, we have half an hour to go. Uh, yes? Oh, one more time. If you want to. Okay, so those type of, so the question was, can we make the display container row a method instead? Can we do that, okay? The answer is yes, ob obviously. Of course we can. But there is one thing uh, you need to remember. These type of functions that are written because the class is not complete, not always you get a class that everything is designed, but you want to show it in a container rule, right? You cannot send a request to the person, change the code of your class and add this value to it. So functions that you write, that makes the object work properly based on your logic, we call them helper functions. So you just learned what a helper function is. Obviously, if I would have designed this, I'm gonna actually show you how I would design the display. So we'll actually see how it would work, okay? So <clears throat> the display I would have designed would have been something like this. First of all, we need to understand what C in and C out are made up of. We include IO stream at the top of our uh, thing because that IO stream header file holds two class definitions in them. One is called I stream, the other one's called O stream. I stream is responsible to get information from console. O stream is responsible to insert information into console. They created two objects out of this and made it global to all uh, code that you are writing, those objects are called for O stream C out, for I stream C in. So C out is as I have C and T over here, an object of container, C out is an object of O stream. And C in is an object of I stream. Okay? We learned in references that I can return reference of something to make that thing impersonate another object. So a, a function can impersonate another object, right? So what I'm gonna do over here to actually make my design better, I'm not gonna write print in a row or something. What I'm going to do is this. I'm gonna say over here display, and I'm gonna put over there integer row set to minus one, an impossible value, got it? And I'm gonna make my display to return a reference of O stream. All right? So, and in my display, I'm gonna say integer row. I'm gonna receive the row. I'm gonna say if, and obviously I'm gonna return O stream reference. Reference. In here, I'm gonna say if row is greater than zero. I could actually set it to zero because row zero never exists, right? It starts from one. So we can actually make this an unsigned integer because rows cannot be negative, right? Unsigned integer and unsigned integer in C++, we have actually a type for it. An unsigned integer that represents rows, indexes, things that matter with size. These things, they, we actually have a type for it. That type is called size t. So I can say size t row. Well, that means unsigned integer row, okay? But I'm not gonna do it now, just letting you know. Integer row zero, so now in here I'm gonna say if row is greater than zero, then c out I, uh, row, c out row, or c out row, and uh, show a column, right? And then show whatever I have. So row is fixed. Now in here, I'm gonna say return C out. So my display not only receives 
an optional argument for a row, but also it returns a reference of C out, so my display can work exactly like C out. So in my code over here, if I want to just show one display, so I'm not, I don't need this anymore, okay? If I just want to show one row, one thing, this is how I show. So I'm going to say C out, just the first one. And now, okay, just the first one, and I'm going to go to new line. Now I'm going to say over here, C and T zero, and I'm going to put display. Exactly as I call display. Do I care what it returns? No. I just want to show one of them, right? And then I'm going to say C out, and I'm going to go and L, and I'm going to show some lines over here and separate it with the rest of the stuff. And I'm going to go in L, correct? Now take a look at here. I want to show it by row. Look what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, I'm going to say CNTI dot display. In here, I'm going to say I plus one. Now I am actually passing a value to it. So the value that it receives, it's going to be greater than zero. Therefore, the row will be displayed. Not only that, I'm going to say afterwards, go to new line and I'm not even showing a C out. Why? Because my display is returning the reference of C out. My display is C out after it's called. It's just a new name for C out. It's an alias for C out. We know what aliases are, and that's how it's going to work. So that makes it cute and nice so I don't have to write a long function saying row, yada, yada. If I put the row number, it's going to show it. If I tell you go to new, tell it to go to new line, it will go to new line. And it, uh, justifies both of the things. And that's uh, not only, uh, <coughs> so it's got to say, uh, so I'm going to put over here again, milk, one, two, three, four, five, and it's going to be one, two, uh, three, four, and container entry water, 220, and I'm going to put over here 220, it's full, and the other one is going to be oil again, and it's going to be a 100, and I'm going to put 55 in it. And when I show it, the first one shows just this is milk, yada, yada, it'll go over there. The other ones will actually show the rows properly with all the shebang that it needs. So it makes the program nice. When you are actually setting stuff with methods, that's not the only thing you can do to make it look nice like that and work beautifully. You can also enforce validation. So when I am over here reading content, if the volume that, if the amount that you're entering is more than volume, that's not right, correct? So I can do enforcement over here saying if m amount is greater than m volume, then make this, so it overflows, right? If I put five liters of coffee in here, it's going to all overflow, and what remains is exactly its size. So I'm going to say m amount is the volume. So I do corrections in my read. So my read is not a dumb read anymore. It's an intelligent read. Also, if I want to receive spaces in the name, I want to say orange juice. If I want to do something like that, now I know an object can contain methods, correct? One of those methods is inside C in. C in does what we say, it, it, it has what we say, get line. Get line essentially means read up to backslash n and throw it away. So it not only reads everything up to backslash n, but throws that backslash n out of the, out of the keyboard. So I can say C in dot <coughs> get line. And getLine actually accepts beautiful things. The first one is the, the thing that it's reading. Secondly, it says, how big? It's 240. I put 240. <clears throat> so if it exceeds 240, CN is going to notice. What did I say about CN and COUT? I said CN and COUT are very, what type of objects? Settings. 
shy. I said, seen and see out are very shy objects. You talk to them badly, they're not going to talk to you anymore. So if I put more than 240 characters over there, they're gonna, it's going to say, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. Which means none of the CNs are going to work after that. They're all going to get disabled. Unless you apologize. Okay? So just to show you how it works, I'm going to make the size of that content thingy over there. Instead of uh, <clears throat> 240, I'm going to make it four. Only four characters. Just to show you what happens. Okay? So now, and that four actually contains the backslash n. So it's actually three. It's not four. It contains the zero at the end. Okay? So if I do something like this and I try to read it, you see I have a loop over here that goes through all the reads and stuff, right? Take a look. I'm going to run it. And I'm going to write over here. For the first one, I'm going to enter water. See what happens. It's more than four, right? Whoosh. It just skipped everything. All the CNs won't even talk to you. The loop that we had with all the things, all gone. It won't work. So. What we can do over here is to actually check to see if C in failed to read something. So I'm going to make this realistic. Instead of 240, I'm going to make it, let's say, a container is how long? Say, uh, I'm going to put 16. Not realistic. That's actually bad. But just put something over there so we can enter something. So I'm going to make that 16. And I'm going to read over here 16 of them. Where is read? So I'm going to say go up to 16. Now what's going to happen? First of all, I'm going to take all these things out and bring the other one with a single one. So I think it was here. No, that's a, why don't I just type it? OK, so <laughs> I'm lazy, man. Very, very lazy. So I'm going to come over here and simply say 1CNT, and I'm going to say um, cnt.read. And cnt dot write uh, th display display and go to new line. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. Are we okay with this? So, <clears throat> all right. So now, because I'm doing something like this, what I can do is this. I can say. <clears throat> I can say if c in dot fail, c in actually has a method called fail. So if c in dot fail, then what I'm going to do? If c in failed and is not good, I'm going to say uh, uh, name the uh, content name too long. C out. I'm going to say content name too long. OK? I'm going to do something like that. And I'm going to go to new line. OK? And in all the other ones, in all the other ones, I'm going to say if C in not fail. So if C in didn't fail, do the C in. So it just doesn't try to, to print stuff over and over and over. Actually, uh, not like that. Even uh, I can actually put it right here. So give me a second. Uh, not here. My apologies. Here. I can say, show that if C in did not fail. So that prompt is going to only be displayed if C in is a good state. And I'm going to add that one to the other one. So now. So now, doing this, I'm not going to print 25 different things. If something goes bad, I'm going to just get print a message and be done. And after each one over here, I can actually put proper error message again. So I can, so I can actually make it very, very, very uh, uh, descriptive. So after each C in, I'm going to say, if it failed, invalid. Uh, 
volume amount. In here I can say invalid, invalid, what is that? Uh, oh, amount value, <laughs> amount value, so volume value. So as you see, it is not like scanf that you do percent d, percent this, percent that. You put one function equals to three, and then you, you it's not like that. Because it's an object-oriented thing, after each read, you can check. It's lots of coding, but it's descriptive. In here, I know that I start, if I get it, if it fails, it's character. Everything is a character. So the only possible way over there is for the thing to be too long, right? So I'm going to say name, con uh, content name too long. Then it tries to read a double. Instead of writing 220, somebody's writing 2 two with like TW, uh, T, T, W, O actually writes 200, and that's not right. So it ca cannot get it, so C in fails to read. The only way this can f uh, fail to read, it means the value is not a valid double value. Therefore, it's gonna say invalid volume value. The other one says invalid amount value. So based on what happens, it's gonna show the message, okay? Now, obviously, uh, yeah, this is not perfectly set. I'm, I'm gonna remove this, this information over here and we'll talk about it more as we go, but uh, mm, yes. Yes, so I'm gonna, re I, I'm, I don't wanna make it complicated too much, so I'm gonna remove that, those values, and all I'm gonna do over here at the bottom because I don't want to have too many ifs and stuff, I'm just going to say invalid container information. Okay? So, yes? Step by step. First, let's do this. And then we have two ways of writing foolproof. Okay. Does read say validated input? Does read say I'm validating? So you shouldn't do validation in it. All you need to do if seeing failed, don't do any more junk. They can always test it over here after reading. So what you are doing, we're gonna do it here. Go look at the other sections class, it's gonna be inside read. So depending on what I'm doing, I am setting it that way. What you can do over here, you can return a code with read. Like let's say, if the first one fails, you return one. If the second one, return two, return three. If it's zero, everything's good. So you can do something like that to return a code and then detect what went wrong and show. We don't wanna, we don't wanna do that. We just gotta say invalid container information. So now, when the user enters the information over here, if they actually enter something bad in here, that is way too long, it's just gonna say invalid container information. Of course, it's gonna print something junk. So what the user can do over here is this. Do, put over here, while cin.fail. So if cin failed, keep asking. And right over here, I'm gonna say if cin.failed, I'm gonna apologize. I'm gonna say, actually, even this is wrong over here. I shouldn't put it, because read is not supposed to print anything. It's, it's not supposed to print any error message. They have to decide what to do. So I'm gonna remove that. In here, I'm gonna say, if C in failed, first of all, I'm gonna say C in the clear. It's all, it's, let me just give you the choice to do whatever you wanna do. Uh, not sure if the error message should be here. We can discuss it later. We can have it somewhere else. So in here, I'm gonna say seeing.fail, right? So if seeing failed, what happens? It means they read tried to read, it couldn't, correct? 
So whatever that could not read, it's still sitting in a keyboard, correct? So I have to flush it. So what I'm going to do in here, first I'm going to apologize to CN. Because if I don't apologize, CN is not going to do anything. So I'm going to say CN.clear. Say sorry. Right? To CN. Now that I said sorry, I'm going to say CN. S ignore whatever garbage you have up to backslash n and do it again. So I'm going to say cn.ignore, say what, 10,000 characters, up to backslash n. So it means keep reading the stuff from keyboard, throw them away until you hit backslash n and stop. Now I have a foolproof thing, and it's inside here. So the person who's actually reading it the writing the code will evaluate it for me because CN remains in a failure state. Now if I run the program, oh, 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 I made a mistake, I made a mistake, I made a mistake, I made a mistake. If I clear it, CN is not gonna fail, so it's gonna come out. I don't want that. So in here I'm gonna say Boolean, done is true. And in here I'm gonna say while uh, not done, and in here I'm going to say done is true, in here I'm going to say done is false. So reading is not done. So what I'm doing, uh, let's just keep, I don't even need to initialize it over there. It's going to give me an error, uh, warning that why didn't you, but it's okay. So it's going to set the done to true, try to read. If it fails, it sets it to false, therefore goes back up. If it doesn't fail, done remains true. Life is beautiful, I'll continue. So now if I run that program, I put some garbage over here, invalid container, okay? Again, container injury. I, I could have printed the message, try again, okay? Please and try again, okay? And now in here I'm gonna say milk, and I'm gonna say five gallons. Invalid because CN couldn't read a double. Now I'm going to say milk. I'm going to say 200, and in here say uh, a little. <laughs> Whatever. Again, invalid. So anything that makes the CN fail, it's going to fail it. It's not going to pass through. Now I'm going to say 200, and in here I'm going to say 100. Now everything's good, and I pass through. And that does validation for me. Are we okay with this? All right. Look at the example in the other class. We have validated it inside the read. Yes? So that ignore, uh, is that it's one of the usage of it. Sometimes you want to ignore a tab in a file. Again, when I say, I said I, the question, that, or from entry. So I said C in, C out. Remember we talked about inheritance? What was inheritance? Anybody remembers? What is inheritance? It's got to be in your questions in the quiz. Inheritance is to reuse your design. When you have a bicycle, you want to make a motorcycle, you stick an engine, now you have a motorcycle. So you use your old design and create something new out of it. IO stream is the same. We have iStream for C in. They inherit it into another one, they call it IF stream. So IF stream does everything CN does, but for a file. So all the things you are learning right now, getting it from keyboard, get used to it. When you are getting it from a file, it will work the exact same way. All you need to do is to tell to IF stream that I have a file. And then all the things you are using for CN, you can use it for a file. As simple as that, okay? So that makes teaching much easier because I don't have to teach you something new. I'm gonna say, remember, C in, now it's a file. So at that time, when you want to ignore everything up to a comma and read the next record, you can simply say file.ignore 1000 and a comma, which means read from the file, ignore it, stop when you hit a comma. Got it? So <clears throat> one of the side effects over here is flushing, because I'm saying read everything. <clears throat> so, This one is going to be a 
h uh, read with validation. Okay, and I, I didn't even and I validation, and I didn't even uh, test the amount being more than volume. Do it, you will see that's that's what's going to happen. <clears throat> it's going to actually uh, work. Now. Now that I have the container that way, let's make the container dynamic. Okay? If I want to make the co uh, uh, container dynamic, all I need to do is to make the content a pointer, right? And in my read right now, what I need to do is to get the information from the entry, put it in a character, and yada, 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 right? For that, I can actually write a function. Okay? So let me see what do I have in here. Yeah. So I need string header file and stuff. So I'm going to bring a couple of things in here that uh, will be useful. Give me two seconds. This is the utils that is in workshop one, I think. I'm going to bring it over here so I don't have to include uh, C string. Paste. So now what I'm going to do is this add existing item. See all those podium fixing and stuff made things go slowly. Okay, so I'm going to add the utils uh, over here. So utils in an SDDS, it has SDR and SDR copy and string compare. We've done it already, so it's going to be in SDDS. So <clears throat> I'm going to put my containers in SDDS, so uh, it, now it works. It's going to be uh, uh, <coughs> in better use. It's going to come in SDDS. That's the, the container. And then in here, I'm going to uh, say using namespace SDDS. As a practice, make the container a module. Separate it in a header file and a CPP file. You know how to do that. OK, so now my content over here is actually supposed to be dynamic. So what I will do instead of this thing, I'm going to say over here character. What do I do? Uh, character, uh, come on, uh, content, <clears throat> 256. Okay, it's not going to be more than that. I'm going to have double. So I'm going to say either I get everything perfectly or I'm not going to get anything. Amount and volume. And in here, when I'm getting the in here, when I'm getting the value, I'm going to say get the content, not M content, up to 256 characters. And in here, I'm going to get, set, get the volume and get the amount and correct it that way. So amount, volume, all the corrections are happening over here. And if it fails, I'm just going to print don't do anything. Otherwise, now I'm going to put the values inside. So now I'm going to say m content is equal to new character str len of content plus one str copy into m content the value of content and even set the double values. So I'm going to say m volume is set to volume. Seriously? All right. m, uh, what is the other one? Uh, amount will be set to amount. And everything's going to be set. So now dynamic memory allocation is happening, and my content is dynamic. Yes? Oh, yes, 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 thank you. And content over here is supposed to, yes, 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 I'll fix it, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I was this close to give you 1%, but. <laughs> All right. So now, it is dynamically set, and we are good. The only problem with this is that now I need two different things in here. I need to make sure that my con container is blank when I start, so void init, okay? I have to initialize it to make sure everything's blank when I start, and I have to make sure I clean up after me, 
Okay? So this init over here will actually, the init over here will actually set the M content to null PTR, sets the amount to zero, and sets the volume to zero. And the cleanup for it, the cleanup, what it will do is to make sure M content is deleted, not to have memory leak. I don't need to set anything else. And I have to make sure not to forget as soon as I create a CNT, I have to say CNT dot init. And at the end, I have to say CNT dot clean up, clear up to give the memory back. Otherwise, I'm going to have memory leak. Yes. Right over here? Oh, yes, you can. But that's, I'm, I have to teach it. I have to teach it. Why? after we go through constructors. Now, if I do this, test this, let me just see if it compiles. I'm just going to run it to see if it crashes or not. Build errors. Uh, no, it's not. It's my SDR copy. Where is it? No, I don't need to. I, uh, did I include? Oh, I did not include. Sorry. Include utils. Dot H. My apologies. Yes. So let's run it one more time. There you go. Now I can enter as big as a thing that I want. Volume 100, 100, and I'm going to get that. Okay? With no problem. It actually adjusts the size. And if I go way too far, it's going to fail and let me know that it's failed. Okay? So test it. Make sure everything's good. Uh, here I explain to the other class. Nobody's waiting outside, do they? Are they? No. no? Okay. So I can actually go, if you don't mind wait, uh, staying like five more minutes, I'm going to just start constructors and destructors for next week, and I'm going to stop right there. So because these are functions that I have to call voluntarily, it is impossible to remember it. You will forget, and it will screw up the thing, and everything's going to go bad. So we need some kind of automation. So in here, I'm going to say uh, GHI, and I'm going to say init and clear up, or clean up would have been better, but eh? OK? So I need some mechanism, something that calls these functions automatically when the object is born and right, after, right before it's going to die, automatically. How do I do that? What I am about to teach you is not a function. Can I make myself clear like that? I want to teach you constructors and destructors. These are not functions. You cannot call them. They get called automatically. You are not to call them. If you call them, they look like a function, but they do something completely different that we're going to teach later. Remember my stress on this. Constructors, destructors, not functions. Got it? OK. So you create a couple of procedures inside your class that are special because they hold the name of the class. Container and tilde container. The first one is called the constructor. The second one is called the destructor. Cause is called when the object is born, is called right before death. So now in here, I don't need to give access to anybody to do these. I'm going to put it in a private part. So nobody can call init or cleanup, but in my container, because it's a function inside, I can call init to initialize it. And inside the destructor, 
I can call clean, clear up to make sure it cleans everything up. Now I do not need to have the init or clear up because when the program is running, as soon as the container is born, automatically the constructor is called and because we called init, it gets initialized and then everything is going to run. Everything is going to run. And when, and it's obviously it's got to get displayed, after display, at the end of the scope, right before CNT is about to die, the destructor is automatically called, and cleanup is called clearing the content. Therefore, no memory leak. Got it? We'll talk about this. This is the subject of next week. I just made your brains ready for it. Are we good about this? Are we okay? One. Are we okay? Two. So, let me push these right now before I forget, because usually I forget. I'm just going to push this right uh, in uh, to GitHub. So, commit. And uh, recording is going to go up later. So, select all of them. And the uh, uh, members, privacy. Uh, constructors, construction intro. Okay, commit and push, and pull first. Push again. We're good. Have yourself a beautiful day. Everything.